Uh, good morning, brother. <clears throat> so I don't have notes uh, in front of me or anything. I listened to that. Um, I just say that because my my thoughts may be scattered a little bit, and this may be longer than it needs to be as a result. Um, or maybe short. Uh, who knows? Um, so I watched that video uh, again the second time. Um, I'm pretty familiar with uh, this type of teaching. This is very typical of the the Seventh Day Adventist. Um, I haven't heard other stuff from this guy. I don't know. He's SDA. Um, I don't know, but but usually where this ends up, um, because they bring up the Catholic influences, is, is they'll call Sunday worship the mark of the beast. Um, okay. Um, <clears throat> everything <laughs> everything's the mark of the beast anymore. Uh, but this is actually a pretty old old one. Uh, I believe eighteen eighteen hundreds. Um, the the Saturday worship group really gained momentum um, but I'm not going to try to negate the argument just by saying you know he's he's bad or he's from that bad group you know um, if, if the Pope speaks truth you know um, it's truth uh, if the Pope believes something you know if, if a Mormon elder believes something that's that's right and scriptural then it's it's right and scriptural we can't do anything about that um so uh, i appreciate you for appreciate you sending me it and and uh trusting me with the info um yeah no problem we can we can talk it out iron sharpeneth iron and i'm not i'm not trying to convince you per se either um because i i think that's i think that's the bottom line again to this um this teaching uh, we all walk before the Lord um, and there are there are realms of our walk that that are I believe led left up to the individual um, I, I believe in individual soul liberty I believe God um, works with each one of us individually um, from where we're at in, in growth and I think that um, there's people that are at different levels of growth uh, so you have Paul saying you know um, you know neither he that eateth or he that eateth not is is condemned and that and that's an important important teaching there um, where where you know Paul said certainly the the weak brother right that eateth herbs um is wrong <laughs> um <clears throat> but paul paul's not going to uh take opportunity to have a fat steak and and both literally and and figuratively rub it in the brother's face that he is wrong uh, lest he cause him to af lest he cause him to be offended is the apostle paul's words there paraphrased um, so with that being said I think that this this case for the Sabbath um, you know he 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 bolstered a couple arguments that he deems common uh, against sabbath keeping and and that's that's a whole other thing to discuss sabbath keeping he bol he bolsters one in particular colossians and then immediately dismisses it by by going back to deuteronomy and saying you know um these these laws are compartmentalized um you know god said put these on the side of the altar um and then the references that that these are a picture of things to come um, and so he says well since the Sabbath wasn't a picture of things to come but was before the law 
Ergo, this is not included. Um, so, I don't think you can do this. When you go to Colossians, you find, uh, let no man judge you. And, and mind you, these Colossians that he was writing to uh, were being heavily influenced by Gnostics. They were being heavily influenced by <laughs> by by the, the pagans, right? That, that, um, that, that the Sabbath guys want to accuse us of being heavily influenced by when we when we meet together for corporate worship on Sunday. So the Apostle Paul is speaking to a group that he he is trying to get out of the influence of Gnosticism, you know, uh, <clears throat> the, the um, what's another group name for them? Um, the, these high, high thinking pagans, essentially. And he says to them in particular there, let, let no man judge you in meats or in drinks or in respect of an holy day. And then this, or of the new moon or of the Sabbath. So to say that, the Sabbath day, sorry. So to say that Sabbath is excluded from this because it was before the law, I, th I think is foolish because in the context, Paul is saying, hey, let no man judge you in these things. And, and if you, you look in your King James Bible there, I know it says Sabbath days, and I know that's right, um, but your, your days there is, is squiggly and in italics. So I don't need to be a, a Greek scholar to know that it, it says there, let no man judge you in meats or in drinks or in respect of the holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath. Um, days there being, being added. Um, by the providence of God and by his his oversight upon the translators um, and them honestly being sure to put in it italics uh, so um, I guess I guess all that to say this if, if this is a, a mark of the beast issue which it usually is with the Sabbath guys um, then we're kind of in in uh, we're, we're we're now going against another principle let's say in, in Colossians as a whole um, we're speaking to these same believers he says as ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord so walk ye in him so we know we received Christ by grace through faith, not of yourselves as a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. That's how you received Christ. So how do you walk in him? By, by grace, and let me have some, some liber liberality with the scriptures here. By grace do you walk through faith, and not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Um, and I, and I think you can um, you can see where I'm going with that, um, where I get that that idea. As you have received Him, so walk in Him. By grace are you saved through faith, right? By grace do you walk through faith. Um, and then, so to connect Sabbath to salvation, as they often do, and I'm not saying He does. Um, you, you're you're essentially bottling up again which Colossians would go against Galatians surely would go against you're bottling up and bringing the law into our salvation and into our walk and as Christian believers we are not under the law but under grace and I can and I can tear that down with with the idea of being under the law or, or constrained by the law by, by going to Romans 6, by going to Galatians 2, um, and, and many other such like places. We are simply, as, as believers, um, under the headship and leadership of the Holy Spirit of God. 
at this point. We have a new man inside of us. This new man is, it is, um, been quickened. And the old man is not just this black dog next to the white dog that's always battling one with another, but rather the old man is dead. Reckon ye yourselves to be dead, indeed in a sin, but alive unto God. Reckon it to be so. Believe that by faith, and that's the beginning of your walk. <clears throat> Even as you received him, so walk in him. So, what I'm saying here is, you have the Spirit of God in you, and that Spirit of God is going to take from the Scriptures... And he is going to guide you into all truth. So if the Holy Spirit of God takes you in your liberality from the law and leads you to a law and convinces you personally that Sabbath adherence is right for you, then you ought to do it. But let no man judge you in meats and or drinks and in respect to an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath. Okay? That's you. That's your personal walk. That's your personal calling before God. And there is nothing wrong with that. If, if it's the Holy Spirit of God that brought you to that conclusion and not simply and exclusively some man guiding you through his mindset with respect to the scriptures. Certainly preaching can bring out the Holy Spirit's leading in you and can can do that work in you. But you got to be sure, you got to try the spirits, whether they have God. <clears throat> For many false prophets are entered into the world. So, let's say the hypothetical man is, is being led to Sabbath adherence. Well, here we go. We're going to bring this one down to, to the... To the where the rubber meets the road. What is Sabbath adherence? Well, as they always like to do, let us go back to when the Sabbath was instituted, apparently. God, in six days, created all, everything that in them is, talking about the world, <clears throat> and he rested on the Sabbath day. In six days, the Lord did all his work and he rested on the Sabbath day. Now go to the commandment. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. <clears throat> Here's how you do it. Six days shalt thou labor. But the seventh, you shall do no labor. Okay? So why are we then, with, with the description of how to adhere to the command to remember and to keep the Sabbath day holy, <clears throat> Why are we bringing <clears throat> worship and fellowship and singing and praise all into this context? <clears throat> Why? Because there's always an ulterior motive. To get you to conform to another religion to bring you back under bondage of traditions of men that they say they're trying to free you from. <clears throat> so, in my opinion, if the rubber were to meet the road here and we were to try to remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, six days shalt thou labor, but the seventh is the Sabbath of rest, in it thou shalt do no labor, right? And there was all sort of specific um, happenings that went on in that and most of that is steeped in tradition nowadays of you know how the Jews would do it not flipping on light switches or all the weird stuff that they consider labor and work um, <clears throat> my opinion is if you wanted to adhere to that six days labor seven show that work you were to say that the one two three four five six seven day because arbitrarily the week starts on Sunday <laughs> and uh, you know and, and do all those things that we do <clears throat> then in order to keep the Friday night to Saturday night Sabbath you got to pick up work on Sunday now see how that works 
<clears throat> and you have to collaboratively and collectively bring all of what we call church over to Saturday, which again goes against the man's whole premise that, oh, you can't say they met on the first day of the week because they met every day of the week. Well, then you can't say that the Sabbath is the seventh day because it, it, it extrapolated the thought is, I believe you got to do it every day. You could do it every day, hypothetically. But no. <clears throat> Look at the command. Six days shalt thou labor, but the seventh is a Sabbath. In that context, he's not saying any day in particular. You catch that? Six days shalt thou rest, but the seventh. <clears throat> so, in order for the Sabbathers to keep consistent, why are they now trying to rebel against the apparent pagan worship of the sun god on Sunday while all the while putting themselves within the constraints of the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, which is Moon Day, Chewie's Day, Woden's Day, Thor's Day, and so on. They're all named after God, gods and goddesses of, of the heathen as it is. <clears throat> Here's what I believe a man would have to do in principle to keep the Sabbath day. Labor six days, take a day of rest. Okay? Now now here would be the Christian, I believe. And and here here's myself. Um who is who is a laborer. would do and I believe led of God you would work what we call Monday to Friday five days you often pick up the shift on the Saturday or get busy about something around the house or take the kids and the family for fun in the sun or whatever it is laboring then six days the seventh being a day where you're not laboring you're meeting together you're preaching you're hearing preaching you're singing you're praising God you're fellowshipping it, it's a relaxed day and there's the wisdom and there's the principle there of the of the Sabbath of rest and it, it's good to take that rest <clears throat> If you were the preacher, man, that, that Sunday, it's not very restful, is it? You got much busyness and work about you, so you may want to Sabbath or, or rest. Six days shalt thou labor, but the seventh is a rest. You may want to rest on Monday, and many preachers do. They just, they take that day off, they rest. They don't, they don't get about much business. <clears throat> I just... I just don't think, bottom line, is that I, I don't think that this argument of instituting a set day within the confines and constraints of the, the pagan calendar, where you will go to church, as they say, and, and calling that Sabbath, which, which you can't... You can't take um, exclusively what happens on a Sunday worship and call that Sabbath. Because some people are working on Sunday. On you know, some people are working during the the collective, you know, worship. You can't take that and say that has to be done on Saturday. Keep it holy. Make sure church is on Saturday. It, it doesn't. It doesn't work when you take what they're saying and you and you try to put it down on the ground where it's practical. I mean, up high, lofty in the clouds, it sounds really spiritual. The guy's really convincing. They're really convincing at, you know, you don't want to be a Catholic pagan, do you? You want to love and worship and, and praise God and, and do right. And you want to not be in violation of James chapter 2, right? But on the ground, how does that walk? 
how does what they're teaching actually get get boots on the ground? I, I think that's what we need to be concerned with. Um, because because everything that God's commanding us to do it, is something that that can practically by faith be walked with boots on the ground. And there's a simplicity that's that's with Christ and in Christ. Um, and uh, I, I, I just think that that's a point that we ought to keep in mind quite often. Um, so yeah, so... <laughs> again, again, I'm... I'm always I'm always concerned with this this James chapter two thing. Whenever somebody brings me to James chapter two, I always chuckle because because especially when they're trying to feed you uh, their own bent, something that is not new but but something that's a little more exclusive. They always go to James chapter two. Well, faith without works is dead. Um, but I, <laughs> I, I believe James chapter two is, is, is basically preaching in a nutshell, work out what God works in. It's God that worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. God works in a man to will, to desire, to do, and to actually do of God's good pleasure. And that's what James is saying is essentially that the men in James chapter 2 were restricting God's working will in them and they were pushing back against God's desire to do through them because of because of their own spiritual wretchedness. Um, he talks about having respect of persons in that context as being something that is is keeping them from from doing what God has put in them to do. And the whole context of James is is about um, what shall it profit? Though a man says he keeps the Sabbath, right? He says with his mouth he's he's pleasing God. He says with his mouth he's doing all of these right things. Yet, his actions are far from him. What is that prophet, his neighbor? What is that prophet, his brother? Answer is nothing. We're justified by men, and through and and in the eyes of men, we are justified as being a redeemed child of God, as being son of the Most High, as being saved, blood bought, born again Christians. We're justified in their eyes when they see us doing what God commanded us to do. Otherwise we appear as hypocrites, otherwise we have faith without works. And faith without works is dead being alone. It's faith nonetheless, but it's it's dead as a doornail. That's what that's what I'm I'm saying. You can still look at that corpse in the ground and say, Yeah, that's Josh. Identify this body. That's Josh there right but that that work or that faith that is on the ground dead it, it, it's alone it's useless it's good for nothing it's not gonna get up and help anybody it's not going to contribute it's not gonna you know that that that's the teaching there God works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure and if you're not doing what God's working in you you're not justified before men you're not helping out your brother and that's what James is teaching in, in the whole context, um, I believe. There, bring it back to the Sabbath. There's a lot of there's a lot of talk about what this is doing for others, um, but not necessarily. Most of these Sabbath guys just want to talk about what the Sabbath is doing for them. It's making them closer to God. It's making them keeping God's commandments. You want God to answer your prayers. You want God to bless you uh, to the more to, to the furthest extent. They said you want God to let you into heaven because you're not saved if you're not keeping the Sabbath. Um, so ultimately what they're doing is boasting. Where have I heard that before? 
boasting and keeping the Sabbath. Where have I heard that before? Ah, Ephesians 2. By grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Right? And the Bible says, as ye have received Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk ye in him. So if you receive him by grace through faith, it says, for by grace do you walk through faith. And not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. I believe this whole Sabbath keeping thing is sanctification through works. They're boasting in it. There's an evidence. They're condemning others who don't do it. And, and ultimately, it's just another way to bring the Christian who is at liberty from the law, that new man that is alive, it's bringing him to the point where he's acting like he's dead, trapped in the bondage of the law. And that's the whole reason why a book like Colossians, and the whole reason why a book like Galatians, and the whole reason why chapters Romans 6, 7, and, and 8 perhaps are written is to tell you you're free from the law. For you're not under law, but you're under grace. Where there is no boasting, where there is no pride, where there is no I'm closer to God than you are because I did such and such. All right, we got an individual walk with God and ultimately the Christian is guided by the Spirit of God as he motivates his conscience to get on board with what he is willing. His will works in you. He's also giving you the power to do what he wills. It's all of God, all glory to him. Our only responsibility is to follow, is to yield, is to submit to his call, his instruction, and his guidance. Hope that makes sense, brother. Uh, let me know later. Let me know. Let me know what you think. God bless.